Welcome to the Good Rookies Podcast. My name is Fahim. And my name is Nellie J, y'all. And we are Good Rookies. (laughs) What's going on, everybody? Happy Good Tuesday. And guess what? It's episode 81. 81. Let's go. 81. Thank you guys for just rocking with the Good Rookies family. And Mm -hmm. folks, Listen, we got an amazing guest on this podcast that's going to drop so much gems. So get your notepads out or your notepad app out. Fahim, please introduce who we got. All right. So it's kind of fitting. Black History Month has just ended the month of February. This is our first episode since February 1st of March. Uh, We have someone on the podcast who keeps the culture moving all year round. It doesn't stop. And when we get to full culture, we'll be able to double down on that more. But let's welcome Antwi Atuahene to the podcast today. Antwi, 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 Antwi. Thanks for having me. That, you, you pronounced my name phenomenally. I appreciate it. Oh my Very God. <laughs> <laughs> no, Antwi, honestly, man, we are so honored to have you on the podcast. I mean, listen, you're a real one. Guys, mm-hmm. we have someone on the podcast as a whole Wikipedia page star. Like Wikipedia, <laughs> you understand? So you understand the level that's happening tonight. So right. on that note, you know, we're going to definitely get into more of what you've been doing for the culture. We want to definitely celebrate you on today's episode. But we got to ask you one of the hottest topics that was trending all week, okay? So we all know Charles Oakley, okay? Charles Oakley. Mm-hmm. He commented on Giannis saying, quote unquote, he wouldn't have been a force back in the day dot 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 he would he would he would have struggled they would have they would make him shoot jump shots oakley also said he wouldn't be doing a euro step to the basket somebody was gonna knock his head off pretty much so you know you play ball you played you're off the court on the court you have all of this knowledge from watching basketball from the 90s to the modern day what's your thoughts on his statement do you agree or disagree well, um, I definitely disagree with Oakley's statement. I think if it was a different player other than, like, Giannis, a player that maybe shies away from contact, yeah. um, agree towards him more. But Giannis is one of the players in the NBA that does not flop. He actually tries to run through guys and run guys over, and he goes downhill at a, at, a, at a frantic pace with a lot of strength, power, and force. He would actually fit in any era. So if he was talking about a different player, I'd probably agree with Oak. But with Giannis, no, Giannis doesn't care who's in front of him. He's trying to get through you, <laughs> jump over you, and run you over. That's his game. And so the, I, I don't think that comparison is, is valid because Oak and those guys struggled against Grant Hill when he came to the NBA. And Grant Hill's not as big and strong as Giannis. And it's, it's, a, it's a big difference. So I don't, I don't agree with Oak on that one. Hey, I mean, I agree. I thought it was poppycock. Is that, that a term called poppycock? Whatever that term is. But I thought it, yeah. I thought it was crazy, to be honest, because I just think that – you know, I get it. Some of these old heads want to be validated, but uh, because their era what is not this era. But come on, guys, it's Giannis, man. This kid is special. Fahim, right. I can assume your thoughts, but please share it with us. <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> Cause you're a big Giannis fan, so yeah. So definitely, yeah. I I rate Giannis heavily. Um, I would have to say, so I'm just trying to put myself in Oakley's shoes. Okay, um, we do know that '80s basketball was a lot more a lot more physical. We know this, right? Um, Think of the bad boy Pistons, you know, like uh, they knocked MJ on his butt and he had to get up and fight for every bucket and just get past them. Um, so when he's talking about the Euro step, something that really wasn't in, I wouldn't say invented or even used back in his day. Um, I would have to say, seeing it from Oakley's perspective, I just don't, I, I'm trying to put myself in his shoes. I don't get it. Um, Giannis has heart. Okay. Right. Giannis. So, I mean, if Giannis was maybe, I'm just right now, I'm just trying to think of maybe a, a taller AD. Uh, right. Oh, just say AD's name. Just say AD. That's, that's, that's what I'm AD. looking for. I think he Oakley was, thought AD when he thought Giannis. That's what I thought. Right. <laughs> right. Exactly. I think, and that's, that's the difference. If he, if he said AD, you know what? I, I might side with Oakley, tell you the truth, but <laughs> yeah. Giannis, he's a, he's a different creature. Like, um, this man, Giannis has won defensive players a year, not just off of blocking shots, but just showing heart, you know, right. um, that's, that's a lot of defense. So um, Oakley's a little out of pocket with this, but we all know with some of the older players, they do kind of tend to hate on the younger players now. Um, could be maybe some 
maybe a little bit of jealousy, you know, uh, they're making money that they weren't making back then. Maybe the league has maybe progressed um, a little bit. So, you know, um, I'll land there with Oakley. Um, I still do respect Charles Oakley, though. Um, but I think yeah, he's got popped with that. He's selling a book, by the way, as well. So, hello. Oh, okay. book. Thank you for mentioning that. All, all, a lot of these outlandish statements he's kind of making, or, you know, it's, it's for his marketing. He's selling a book. If you look at Giannis, his frame is the same as like David Robinson, who was a center mm-hmm. at those days, right? And those guys couldn't stop David. So now you have a guard, <laughs> the same frame and size as David Robinson, seven foot, 250, muscular, coming downhill. At a frantic pace, no one's gonna be stopping you. African, no real African. Yeah. You don't real, care yeah, about yeah, yeah. nobody. You don't care about no exactly. one in America. Hey, hey. Well, how y'all <laughs> mean? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I don't like Oak for that one, but it's cool. I got respect for Oak too. Yeah, yeah. me too, me too, me too. No doubt. Um, so I'm excited. You know what, Nelly J, let's go to For the Culture. For the Culture, we like to highlight individuals for the culture. And today, we get to highlight Antwi Atuahina. So first of all, okay, Antwi, listen, you're a real one. You got a Wikipedia page. If you Google this man, guys, enough pages that come up, you're like, okay, he's legit, legit. So I just want to know, first question, do you sleep? Like, do you actually sleep at <laughs> night? And yeah, because <laughs> I feel like you power nap it throughout the day, but do you actually have like a nice sleep at night? You know what? Um, I, 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 I do a better job of resting now. I have more balance okay. in my life now. But yeah, there was a time period like I didn't sleep as much. I was just, you know, on the go and I had to stop that so I can get more of a balance of rest. Yeah, because folks, for those who don't know, okay, Antwi is the GM of two professional teams. Mississauga Tigers, okay, and the Niagara, and and the CEBL League, Niagara River Lions Basketball. On top of that, he runs uh, shop, like, like labels, events, uh, tournaments. Like, Antwi, my head spinned around when I saw all the things that you're doing. And so we want to take the time because someone like you, you're doing so much for the culture in Canada, for the culture in Toronto, and for people of color. And I don't think people even really know the extent of your work that you've dedicated to the youth and to the people in Ontario. So I wanted to give you your flowers today. Um, but before we jump into each aspect of what you do, you know, Yana's been a comment to AI, loved it. He was like, you know, Al Iverson, watching you growing up is the reason why I play basketball. And then AI said to, uh, about in his documentary, watching Michael Jordan is the reason why he played basketball. So I want to know. Who, well, who was your why? Why did you, why did you play, play basketball also? Why did you want to dedicate your life not only to basketball, but to sports in, in Toronto? Yeah, that's a great question. I think um, it starts off with my older brother. I have a brother that's three years older than me. His name, his name is Magic, and he used to play basketball. I was really good at it. So it started off trying to compete against him. And then when I got into, like, um, let's say, like, early teens, I always wanted to be like Michael Jordan. Or, um, or Isaiah Thomas, those are guys I looked up to. But it started off definitely with my older brother. And then guys that were in my neighborhood, like a guy by the name of Mike Schmidt, he went to um, Texas A&M afterwards, and then he came to Niagara. First player ever single Division One. Then a guy by the name of like Jason Francis, we call him Skippy, in the hood. And um, he, was, he was our Allen Iverson for Rexdale. Those are the first like three and four guys that I've seen growing up that made me want to play, but also made me want to surpass them. So those are, the, those are my wives growing up. Those were like, it, was, it wasn't like we had guys going into the NBA from Canada mm-hmm. like that. So you have to like draw inspiration from guys close to you that are doing things. That was my why. Well, that's really great because, you know, you are Guinean and Canadian and you also played in the National Basketball League of Canada. And we've had oddly the commissioner and now the VP of operations on this podcast. So it's just really great that you really dedicate your life. You played Arizona State. You came back to Canada. You played professional here. You've played in a, a lot of tournaments that I've met you at in Toronto. So I just love seeing that your growth from just playing to now just investing your time and in op- the operation standpoint. Um, what, what do you think Canada can do better when it comes to helping the youth uh, pursue a career professionally, not only in basketball, also in any sport, major league, like baseball and so forth? That's, that's another phenomenal question. I think um, what we lack is our marketing of not just um, the front office people, but our players. You rarely see like um, uh, someone wearing a Jamal Murray jersey, someone wearing an Andrew Wiggins jersey, someone wearing a Shea Giggles Alexander jersey, who's actually the 
I think you got the, um, the NBA fashion award of last year for <laughs> ability to dress off the court. So you can see he has charisma and everyone in Canada should be representing these guys. Luanne's Dort went to Arizona State. Mm -hmm. I think the marketing of our players um, in Canada isn't as widespread as it should. Then also I think what we can do a better job is, is giving them visual representations of guys in the front office, guys doing operations, guys doing maybe videography or photography like my guy Trist from the Raptors now, like mm -hmm. showing younger generation visual representations of what they can and, and strive to be um, is, is a great thing that we can do because I think I'm a first generation Canadian. I think my, my parents are from Ghana and I think a lot of the people now are second generation Canadians where their parents were born in Canada and they have a, a better opportunity to like strive to the next level. So exactly. we can do a better job of marketing that. I love that. Mm -hmm. I've always been saying that marketing has been a downfall. We actually were talking about, you know, we have um, F FAA, <laughs> um, the tennis player. Oh, uh, Felix Oje Alessim. Yeah, yeah. I, I'll say his last name because, you know, I butcher your last name. Actually, your last name. I'm, sure, I'm surprised to butcher it today. But um, no, but, but Felix, like, he is a phenomenal guy. He just won his first ATP tournament. He's yeah. doing so many great things. And, like, you really hear about him in the culture. Like, we don't right. even talk about him. So I think you're right about definitely um, really marketing and highlighting our stars within Canada. Go ahead, Fahim. Another question. Okay. Um, so I'm, I'm just kind of taking in um, what Anthony's saying. Uh, so from what I'm getting, uh, you mentioned about just being able to see things because it's kind of like when you see it, you can achieve it, right? Sure. Um, you mentioned uh, Michael and Isaiah uh, being influences for you uh, getting into basketball. Um, so I just want to throw this then. Actually, I'll throw this. Nelly J, can you give me, say, two African players? There's any two. Oh, I will say, hmm. <laughs> I will say, of course, Giannis. I'm gonna give him mm -hmm. one. Okay. I'll say Embiid. I'll say Siakam. Okay, yeah, okay hold on, hold on. You're taking okay. them all off the table. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> and Tui, yeah, give me two, two African players. Any uh, and history, not just now, just any. Okay, the Kemi Mutombo, mm -hmm. um, Manupo. There you Ooh, go. Manupo. Um, yes. Yeah, that's very good. Um, uh, so I guess the point I'm making is whenever we name. African players, they always seem to be front court players, right? Mm. Um, it's very rare that you have um, an African player who's a back court player. Uh, you are a back court player yourself. Um, I just want to really know um, how far do you think we are? Because it, when I was coming back to what I'm saying about seeing and being able to achieve it, um, if you're not seeing you yourself, if you're not really seeing African players being in the back court, um, how far do you think we are to having that one breakout? African player come out and be a backcourt player and furthermore then that would maybe inspire and push for more African backcourt players? That's a, that is a really, really good question, honestly, because um, I thought about that growing up a okay, lot, right. not just Canadian, but African as well. Mm -hmm. Right. And um, here's what I connected with, because when they bring in these African players, they usually look at their superior athleticism or size and length and strength. Um, for the most part, um, the backcourt players are usually used for IQ and shooting. Here's what they think Africans lack at, right. is being intelligent on the court and being able to shoot the ball. If you know Giannis is not known for shooting, you know, mm -hmm. Siakam just started getting a shot together. And, you know, jo Joel is a different person, but yeah. he just, he don't really count. He's, like a, <laughs> he's, a, he's an outlier. <laughs> outlier, right? Right. <laughs> outlier. So, I, I think if we treated our basketball development in Africa – such as how they did in Europe, and we had people helping them develop these skills, soft skills, what I call it in basketball, yes. like touch, shooting, passing, versus just making sure you can run and jump and dunk over people, I think will be a far, farther or closer to like the bridge of a, getting a, a backcourt guy in the NBA. But I do think there's guys out there now that can so, actually help, like a Frank Lanita, Nina Akita, whatever the name is. Right, yes, Frank yes. Nenakita, right, right. But, but as you can see, he's not like a high IQ guy. If mm -hmm. that makes sense. He's known for his defense. Mm -hmm. We have to get one high IQ basketball player that may not be the most athletic, but just knows how to play the game of basketball, like a Luca. But he's, mm -hmm. but he's, but he's African, and that'll right. change the whole game. So right. question on that, because I think, do you think what needs to be done? Because, you know, we, we have access to all the old games, like, historically, right? They show all the time. Do you think that we need to probably educate 
from like a younger age because i know in africa you know my dad and my cousins everyone back in nigeria they're all about soccer football football right. football football right and a lot of african players don't play basketball until they're a bit older do you think it's trying to kind of incept or inception of you know making them love the game of basketball at a younger age so they're watching basketball games when they're four when they're five they're seeing because i really think like kids see things because like you know the special kids like the Stephs and the chris pauls you know with the high iqs i feel like they just kind of engulfed in the game from a very young age so i'm wondering do we just have to maybe just educate these guys and, and give them exposure to basketball thankfully the bal is there now but you know giving kids more exposure to basketball at a younger age not when they're 12 14 but you know when, when they're like 10 you know what i'm saying because i think in canada we have a, a younger age group for basketball you guys did your you guys did your homework on this podcast no oh, no. I, I, no honestly <laughs> no, is, like I'm we talking, haven't discussed this at all this we is, haven't like we're, is, we're, we're talking about the talk top. About. oh really so okay about, like one of my guys that are general managers and things like that. so here, here's oh. the thing, here's how i look at it so just, the, the two names you name let's say the two names let's say steph curry Let's say Seth Curry, let's say Chris Paul, let's say yeah. Luca. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All four guys high IQ. Steph Curry and Seth Curry's father played in the NBA. Mm -hmm. They've been around the game since they were infants. Mm -hmm. Luca's father was a professional basketball player. Right. He's been around the game since he was a kid. Steph, um, Chris Paul's father was a really, really good basketball player in the South. Mm -hmm. And he had an older brother that was a star player as well. So Chris has been around the game his whole life. So Chris mm -hmm. is in my class, class of 03. Mm -hmm. So when we went to NBA camp, Nike All-American camp, Chris was signed to Wake Forest as a sophomore. He knew mm. where he was going when he was a sophomore already. So he was engulfed in the game. He thinks the game at a different level. He's a high yes, Because yes. they're around the game of basketball so much, they learn the game that much more by watching, being around it, and seeing things. In Africa, football is the cheapest sport you can play. Exactly. You just need a ball, and it costs something called small poles, where they just get two rocks, and that's your goal post, and then it's play. Right. You don't need a rim. You don't need shoes. You don't need... A uh, uh, foul line, so it's the cheapest sport you can play. So in, in, in Africa, where there's some poverty and some impoverished environments, and there hasn't been as much investment into that sport, the most kids gravitate to football because it's cheaper, and that they see that as their way out. But now, once things starting to change, and people are starting to invest in Africa more, um, and see like these NBA stars, hopefully they give back to Africa as well. The BAL Masai is doing a, Masai, a phenomenal job. Um, yeah. Kids are going to start to see, oh, you know what? This basketball thing is a phenomenal sport too. And the, the transferable skills I learned from soccer, the footwork, the body control, the teamwork, the camaraderie, all transfer to basketball. Absolutely. So I think it's going to turn. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I think, uh, so when I think of a backcourt player, I did, because um, you, okay, I'm just, let me pull this here. Uh, Moudier, Matt, Emmanuel Moudier. That's my guy. Okay, okay. So he's, because you were mentioning players before, uh, uh, when you said Nikita before and mm -hmm. uh, Moody, they're kind of the same. See what you're saying? Not really like super high IQ guys. Right. Um, Moody is the one that made it, but still not in that upper tier where it's, it's enough to influence. Right. right. Um, and what Masai and Giants of Africa are doing is, is amazing. Um, I guess where I'm going with this is how far do you think we are? Because I have a feeling um, the next backcourt uh, star is going to come through that program that Maasai has, the Giants of Africa, just because it's already it's it's already nurturing and growing, right? And it's, it's right. so how far? Just give me a, a timeline. How far do you think we are away from that happening? You know what? Honestly, I think we're around two years away because a lot of the African players now, you know what? They're in Europe playing, right? So a lot of those young African guys, they're actually like 15, 16, 17, and now they're playing in the professional Euro Leagues, mm -hmm. literally right now. Right. And there's a couple of guys right now that I've, that I've been looking at that are playing in the Euro Leagues in France and Belgium and Germany, but they're African, like a Dennis Schroeder. Right, mm -hmm. right. You know what I'm saying? Like, so yeah. those are the type of guys that are coming up now, but they may be, they may be stationed in Europe, but yes. they're really African because their families went there for basketball and things like that. But yeah. mm -hmm. we're two or three years away from actually an African backward player getting his name across the draft. Wow. That's awesome. You know what? It's something. It's so funny because for him and I, like, we talk basketball all day. Like, we're basketball heads. And so <laughs> this is actually just off the fly. We're just bring, like, this kind of organically became a conversation that I think uh, is so important for us to talk about. Don't talk like this. Yeah, the, the, yeah, we, we're yeah, we're 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 ball, we're ball heads, but um, <laughs> yeah. no, but it's it's interesting because I really think you know, uh, I think basketball is a way for people of color to get more power in the system, right? Mm -hmm. Money is more power, more power is money, and I think sports is a good outlet for people and 
and also being a part of the operations of sport. You know, in the NBA, we talk about not enough GMs, right? In Canada, we have the CEBL and we have black GMs here. And I think it's so important and special. We have Nico now setting up with the Scarborough team, your GM, Javon, like it's just amazing. So how does it feel to kind of be a pioneer and be a black man GMing a, prof a professional team in Canada? How does that feel for you? <laughs> it feels great. It feels great. I, have, I take great pride in it. Um, I feel like I'm the best out of everybody. I feel like I take it. <laughs> you have to. Like, as you should. Yeah, as you should. I don't, even, I don't even feel I know I'm the best out of everybody. <laughs> um, I feel I take this extremely serious. I feel like I, I wear a badge of honor. I want to be a, a representation of, you know, strength, leadership, and the ability to use my mind to build culture for a team. It's mm -hmm. bigger than it's, my measure of success isn't just winning a trophy. If I wanted to win a trophy, I'll beat everyone by 50 by recruiting. But my measure of success is building, is building men and helping them get to the next level in life, period. Um, and that's my main thing. So um, I'm excited about it. Every single day I wake up um, motivated. Um, and it, it's a blessing. It truly is. Mm -hmm. um, I want to transition off of ball for one second. Because what I find really fascinating is I was really, I was shocked when I saw, okay, it wasn't really so much surprising for me to see that you were a GM for the CEBL uh, Niagara River Lions. It wasn't like, I was like, okay. When I seen you are a GM for a baseball team, I was really confused. And that's what I really want to, <laughs> you know, like I, there's got to be some story behind this uh, where um, it's one, we're in Canada. Uh, it's the Blue Jays, but uh, baseball, even at the grassroots, just doesn't seem to be connecting in the black community. Like, uh, you know what I'm saying? Like there isn't, right. so, so to see you as a black man being a GM for a baseball i just i need to i need to hear more about this yeah i mean uh, i grew up playing baseball my father is was, was a cricket player and he was a big baseball fan my favorite team was the cedo gaston blue jays with uh -huh. devon white joe carter yeah um, that was Kelly, my team um, <laughs> Kelly Gruber, i think they had paul monitor as dh i knew those guys like the back of my head i go from jesse barfield days mm -hmm. to all that stuff lloyd Maybe mosby picture, lloyd mosby <laughs> like these are my guys so yeah. I, in our era when we grew up we went to a rec center in a rec center, you play ping pong, you play soccer, you play basketball, you yep. play soccer, baseball, you play whatever <laughs> they play, you play. Right. It's not like you just play one sport. And right. I was great at, I was a great baseball player. I was a, I played the third base in the short corner. And one of my close coaches um, from high school, he runs a baseball program in Mississauga. And um, we always had this, I always had a goal of like connecting baseball with the black community a lot more. And our team is the most diverse team in baseball now. And we actually have, a scholarship called the Cedar Gaston Scholarship, where we have wow. black kids be able to play on our team with scholarship money because they can't wow. afford baseball, right? Mm -hmm. But that was the number one thing we wanted to do. That's why I wanted to connect the dots and kind of bridge the gap. And Cedo Gaston actually is good for, he's the godfather of one of the guys that own our team. So Cedo Gaston actually signed off on a scholarship. He speaks about it, et cetera. And this is our second year doing it. Like if we had five kids last year, and this year we're probably going to have another five or ten. So that's the biggest reason why I'm in baseball. And baseball is a lot more low maintenance. It's not basketball players. Mm -hmm. You guys yeah. just chill and work out. They don't bother nobody. They're not on Instagram all day. Like, they're just good guys. So not to say basketball players aren't good guys. Right. But you know what I mean. A little, bit no. of, you have to, a little bit of arrogance you have to have when you're a basketball player to, like, to be great. So <laughs> Listen, so y'all, I've seen him play basketball. And trust me, on the court, you don't want to play with Antwi. You know, you don't want to play with this one <laughs> on the court. Let me tell you this. Oh, the, 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 the professional, you know, all this. No, no, no. On the basketball court, he's a different man, yo. So big up to you. Um, so before we close out for the culture, I definitely wanted to plug all your things. So you have an apparel. You do events. What's coming up for you for the event side, for, for your basketball uh, tournament, and for the apparel? What's, what's happening? Pl plug it, please. Well, for the apparel, I just dropped my favorite piece ever made for me is the Mansa Musa shirt that I just that dropped. That shirt was fire, I bro. I saw, I saw that on IG. I was like, lit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. That's my favorite piece ever made because it tells us tells a story that hasn't been told. Like, um, and I feel like just the conversation that's been having just after people seen that shirt has been everything. Um, so that's what I just dropped for the end of Black History Month, but it's going to go throughout the year. I'm going to let that rock. Um, that's apparel-wise. Event-wise, um, we just did like a deal with like a a hookah spot in Niagara Falls. We're gonna be doing a lot of stuff. We wanna wanna con continue to contribute in the culture. Yeah, yeah. We have it's like a hookah it. lounge, a brand new upscale hookah lounge. We're gonna be doing um, events called Elevate VIP. So it's more of like an exclusive vibe networking event. Hookah will be there like for decoration, but it's more of a laid back 
feel where you can meet people and interact. Um, and that starts in March. Um, other than that, um, I'm getting ready for my, my, my season with the Niagara River Lions in mm -hmm. May. And I'm also the assistant general manager for the BCLA team, which is the um, basketball champions in Latin America that we're doing with the CEBL. So my team right now is in Nicaragua as we speak. They get oh. back on May, on March 9th, and we play in Calgary on March 15th and 16th. So I got to go to Calgary on the 10th for another seven days to try to get into the finals. And apparently, guys, he sleeps. Apparently, y'all, he sleeps. Apparently. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't believe him still. I don't believe him still. <laughs> wow. Well, folks, we're going to have all the things, the apparel links, everything, because he's someone you want to follow, uh, learn from, engage with, all of that. Like, if you feel demotivated, just play one of his videos. Legit. <laughs> just play it. Just press, press play. Press play. They're good to go. All right. Um, so I, mm -hmm. I was just, I want to spend one, one, one more thing on, on the way out. Yep. So. I decided to double check on myself. Okay, so here we go. Uh, we talked Blue Jays, old school Blue Jays. Danny Ainge played for the Blue Jays. Mm -hmm. Do you know what position? I think he played, not shortstop. He played second base, I think. <laughs> oh, because you, you, you mentioned you played the hot corner third. I played the hot corner. Right, and so did Danny Age, apparently. He played Hot James. Corner, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, knew, I knew he played Hot Corner. He didn't play Short, because Short is like the point guard. Yeah. Like, did he play Hot Corner? Like, like, he might have been played second. Yeah, he was like, for the Jays. Um, he played Hot Corner in second. I know he didn't play Short. I know he didn't play right. I know he didn't play first. One of the two. Right. Oh, but that's so funny, yo. Nice, nice. <laughs> that's a good one. <laughs> you got to do your homework on this podcast, man. Oh, yo, yo, we just talked. Yo, we just talked the things, man. This is just organic. Eighty-one <laughs> weeks straight. Great. You know what I mean? We're just talking <laughs> the things, man. <laughs> this is great. This is great. All right, so yeah, that was for the culture and Nelly J. Let's go to that's absurd. That's absurd for him, bro. What was absurd this week? What was absurd? Da. Floyd Mayweather on womp, Fat Joe's. Womp. Yeah, Bob. on Fat Joe's <laughs> IG Live, Fat Joe asked him, uh, what's your top five? So four other than Floyd, because obviously he's going to list themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, he listed his top five, or his top other four, mm -hmm. um, n neither Muhammad Ali or Mike Tyson were included in his top five. I'm going to go with absurd. Absurd. Um, okay, so you're telling me that so, okay, do we think that Floyd just maybe is annoyed that people always pick those two for their go? You know what I mean? Because I, I know Floyd has some type of, he always says that people disrespect him. And to me, what's your thoughts on this statement by Floyd? Is it hate? Is, it, is he being keeping it real? I don't think he's keeping it real at all. I was, if, if he was keeping it real, <laughs> like I understand the, um, Pernell Whitaker. I understand the Sweet right. P1. I, I, if he would have said Pernell, Sugar Ray, um, Robinson, Sugar Ray Leonard, et cetera, like a lot of middleweights and guys that are in his class that he looked up to, I would have left it alone. But then he right. added Larry Holmes. That guy, that like, that doesn't make sense to me. So if you're going to add Larry Holmes as a heavyweight and not bring in Muhammad Ali or a Mike Tyson <laughs> or even, you don't even talk about Roy Jones Jr. in there. So I know there's a lot of, he wants to separate guys that can probably be called the GOAT to me and right. make sure he stands out as the GOAT. That's what I looked at it as. Mm-hmm resentment that's what i want to sing to him yeah you're right man honestly like muhammad ali is my freaking goat he's my number one um but even sugar ray like there's so many other boxes you could have named like anyways that's his opinion but that is absurd for him. yeah yeah he, i mean he's entitled to choose whoever he wants um but i i do find it um, anyone who could be a threat to him, I think he kind of left them off the list purposely. Right. You know, so um, yeah, I'll, I'll just land that with, with, with Floyd. Actually, real quick, Anthony, if uh, you see him, because you mentioned uh, Sugar Ray and so you, and the Walter Waits, you follow boxing somewhat a little? Yeah, 100%. Why don't you give me your top five? Go ahead. Um, Muhammad Ali. Mm -hmm. I got Roy Jones Jr. Mm -hmm. Number two, I got Floyd, number three. I got Iron Mike, number four. And I got Marvelous Marvin Hagler, number five. Ooh. Hagler. Hagler. Good. Yo, okay. That's a solid list, man. That's a solid mm. list. Nice, And the reason nice, why I nice. picked some of those guys, I'm not saying, like, they were the best for the longest period of time, mm -hmm. but there was a part, there was a portion in, in, in their boxing careers where they were just dominant. And they right. took the best fights. So I got to right. yeah. give them their love. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's fair. That's, true, that's fair. That's true. 
I got a quick top five. I'm gonna go with uh, Sugar Ray Robinson, uh, Joe Lewis, two guys before my nice. time, but I, nice. I, I rate them. Um, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll go with Muhammad Ali. I will throw I Mike in there. Uh, and my fifth, if I were to go, ooh, and mind you, I haven't even thought of this. Uh, my fifth, I'm thinking Walter Waits. You know, I'll go with Sugar Ray Leonard, and I realize he's not the mm-hmm. best, but he's, he's one from, from my time coming up that there's, a, there's an emotional uh, right. part to that. So I'll go with that. So, so, that. so for you, not Mayweather for you? Not Mayweather? Oh. Okay, so uh. I'll do my top five quickly. So no order. <laughs> Muhammad Ali, Mayweather, Roy Jones Jr., uh, Sugar Ray, and then Iron Mike. Was my five. That's a good one. But yeah, I will say I will probably do a honorable mention of Manny Pacquiao. I think he's also nice. he's nice. right nice. there, right nice. there for me. Very can nice. I, can yeah. I throw one more since we're on this? <laughs> I, I think that Manny Pacquiao, his body of work that he's done for his career, is more impressive than Floyd's undefeated. Oh, okay. yeah. Let's, Manny let's Pacquiao's leave, lost, let, let, but if you look at there, because he yes, Okay, it. let's land there. My bad. My bad. <laughs> that's gonna open a whole kind of worms. Okay, but actually, definitely. No, you're, no, you're a boxer or boxing. We'll definitely have you back on again. Mm-hmm. Talk about some boxing and some other stuff. But mm-hmm. yeah, it's For a great episode, man. <laughs> All right. So now you just put it in the books. That was episode 81. 81. Oh. So, Antwi, we love to give our special guests like yourself a chance to do a special shout out. So the floor is yours. I'd like to shout out you guys. You guys did a phenomenal job. Thanks for bringing me on here. Shout out um, everyone who's just trying to, you know, get to the next level in life. It may seem tough right now, but, you know, keep striving. I think the main thing great people do is just don't quit. Um, it, may, it may be always know to stay the course of light at the end of the tunnel. That's the biggest way to look at it. And shout out everyone who's following the movement, Noir and Noir, and let's keep going. Noir and nice. Noir, thanks you so much. We're going to have all the information so you can stalk him like I did this week. Uh, <laughs> so I want to shout you out for taking the time. You're a busy person, so we don't take your time lightly. Nope. Um, so definitely, we'd love to Thank have you. you back on again. I definitely also want to shout out just the CEBL, the league. I think what you're doing there is really great. A lot of great talent, and I think the timing is perfect. So hopefully, I already bought tickets for the Scarborough game, the opener. I bought my tickets already this past month. <laughs> Where's that? So I, I think the Panama is it the Panama? But I bought tickets online. They Honestly, got a team out there? Scarborough got a team in the CEBL. I never heard of it. No, yeah. heard of it. shots fired. Shots, shots fired. fired. You They're come bought a team. Bro, listen, come no, bro, listen, bro, listen, listen. Okay, <laughs> but I bought tickets for the opener, so definitely no, I'm happy dope. about that. Yeah. Shout out Scarborough. I love those guys. <laughs> definitely. Nice. Um, my quick, my shout was quick. First of all, entry to you. Slew for coming through. Uh, enough respect to you. Um, I want to shout out uh, the Niagara River Lions, your squad. Best of luck this year. Thank also, you. want to shout out the Mississauga Tigers, Tigers baseball team that you general manage also. Best of luck with that Appreciate also. It. All right. Thank and you very much. Not a problem at all. That's episode 81. 81. Guys, please like, tell a friend to tell a friend and subscribe for him. <laughs> you know where to find us if you're looking for us? We're on all platforms. That's Good Rookies Podcast, episode 81. And, and we, we out. out. Peace. Peace.